السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا ومولانا محمد عبده ورسوله أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في القرآن المجيد بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون وعن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم بني الإسلام على خمس شهادة أن لا إله إلا الله وأن محمدا عبده ورسوله وإقام الصلاة وإيتاء الزكاة والحج وصوم رمضان أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام First and foremost, I would like to start off by saying that why aren't we filling up the chairs in, chairs in front? Is there any issue with the chairs in front? Inshallah, those who come, inshallah, they'll come sit at the back, inshallah. So, Sahaba radiallahu anhu used to be eager to go and sit as close to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I'm not saying that. I'm at that darja, but let us, the words that are spoken, inshallah, are words of deen, words taught to us by Nabi Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, while seated, let us have that in our heart. The Nabi Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, مَنْ يُرِذِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا يُفَقِّفُ فِي الدِّينِ That when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants good for somebody. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to give someone something good. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him the understanding of deen. Today a lucky person is not a person who, who's got a very big house or who's got you know more pocket money than the other. A lucky person is the one who's got understanding of deen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him understanding of deen. So mashallah we've got an opportunity here to understand deen. We all here with the intention of understanding Deen. So we must regard ourselves luckier than those outside. Those outside haven't got this opportunity. We've got this opportunity. So let us regard ourselves luckier than them. Anyway, dear students, today the topic given to us is fast lane, the month of Ramadan. Now, those who are sitting here, most of you all must have been on the highway. We've got, mashallah, we've got a highway in Sri Lanka, no? So, in the highway, we've got only two lanes here. But if you go to highways elsewhere, in other countries, some countries have highways where there are five, there are five lanes. Actually, if you, even on some bridges, the highway has four lanes on each side, total of eight lanes. So there, the, if it's a car which is left-handed drive, then the rightmost lane, or I would say, sorry, the leftmost lane would be the fast lane. If it's right-handed, like our country, then the rightmost lane will be the fast lane. What's the speciality of a fast lane? Now, they've asked me to speak till 6. I'm not going to speak till 6, so I'm going to allow you to speak also. What's, what's the advantage of a fast lane? I know fast lane, you all must have understood, okay, fasting. So fast lane comes from that. Yes, this is what they meant, but... When we say fast lane in a highway, what do you understand from that? What's the advantage of a fast lane? You can reach the destination faster. That's the advantage. If on a slower lane you're reaching in one hour, in a, in a faster lane maybe you'll reach in 40 minutes. So that's the definition of a fast lane. Why have we called Ramadan here a fast lane? Because compared to the other months, we reach our destination at a quicker pace. That's why we regard Ramadan here at a fast lane. So much so when we look into the ahadith of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
that Salman Farsi radiallahu anhu narrates that Nabi Kram sallallahu alayhi wa just a day before Ramadan on the last night, last day of Sha'ban, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa comes and speaks to us. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Ya ayuhan nas, qad adallakum shahrun azimun mubarakun. Verily, a very auspicious month has dawned upon you. Very blessed month, a very auspicious month has dawned upon you. Shahrun fihi laylatun khayrun min alfi shahr. Yes, the month has a night which is better than thousand other nights. So very auspicious month. And shahrun ja'alallahu qiyamahu faridatun. Or siyamahu faridatun wa qiyama laylihi tatawwa'i. It's a night wherein Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made fasting obligatory and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made qiyamul layl that is standing in prayer in the night Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it a virtuous deed. And thereafter Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, مَن تَقَرَّبَ فِيهِ خَصْلَةً كَانَ كَمَنْ أَدَّى فَرِيضَةً فِي مَا سِوَاهُ فَمَنْ أَدَّى فَرِيضَةً فِيهِ كَانَ كَمَنْ أَدَّى سَبَعِينَ فَرِيضَةً فِي مَا سِوَاهُ that when a person does a good deed, what we would say as a knuckle act, a desirable act. When a person does a desirable act, then it's as if he's done an obligatory act in a month other than Ramadan. So Ramadan, you do one desirable act, we get the virtue of a farb act, a compulsory act. And what about a person who does a compulsory act? Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says he gets the reward of 70 compulsory acts in another month. So if you look at it that way, we get 70 times multiplied. The reward that we would get in a normal month is multiplied by 70 in the month of Ramadan. So if you can travel at 60 kilometers on the slow lane per hour, then on the faster lane maybe you could travel to, uh, around 120 to 140. Kilometers. So you're reaching your goal, your destination in half the time. But here Ramadan, you're reaching it into 70. It's multiplied, the speed is multiplied into 70. So it's much faster than any fast lane that we have in the world. SubhanAllah. And when we look at the reward too, when it comes to Ramadan, Nabi Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that, Kullu amal ibn Adam lahu illa suyam. That every virtuous deed of the son of Adam, that means every virtuous deed that you and I, we do, is for us. We're getting rewarded. We're getting rewarded. Why, why am I doing a virtuous deed? I'm getting rewarded. I'm doing it for Allah. I'm doing it to please Allah. But Allah is going to reward me. So it is for me. But Nabi Sallallahu Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, every virtuous deed you do is for you. Except siyam, except fasting. Why? فَإِنَّهُ لِي You're doing it for me. I, I mean, you, you've got nothing from it. You've got nothing from it. It's for me. And wa'ana ajizibihi, I will reward you for it. Now imagine, let's say, for you all to understand, the principal of the school says that, okay, I've got a project. Who's ready to do? We're not specifying any reward for it. We're not specifying any credit for it, except that I, from my side, will credit that person, will reward that person. Will we accept it or won't we? Yes or no? Yes, we will. Why? The principal or the director of school of the school is saying that I will credit. We know that it's going to be something very big. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord of all the worlds, the King of all kings, is telling us that I am the reward for it. So imagine what kind of reward we'll get when we fast. So when we look at the reward, and in another reward it comes, وَأَنَا أُجْزَابِهِ That I become the reward. When you fast, what do we get? We get Allah. What more do we want? We're getting Allah. Today we have a contact in one of the higher positions. I mean, we don't want anything else. Similarly here we're getting contact in the highest of all positions. Allah becomes our contact. Allah becomes ours. So we can fulfill anything that we want. So when we look at Ramadan in this way, Ramadan is a fast lane through which we can achieve more than any other month, more than any other lane. So once we've understand, understood this, now we need to understand our destination. Yes, we've come on to the fast lane. Ramadan is less than a month away from us. So we understand in less than a month, inshallah, we'll be witnessing Ramadan 
our, our vehicle will move on to the fast lane. Now the question is, what is my destination? And this question I pose to you all. You all have to answer me, what is our destination in Ramadan? Anyone? What is my goal? What do I attain in Ramadan? Anyone can answer me? Piety. Anyone else? If you improve your self personality, mashallah. Anyone else with any other answers? We're moving into the fast lane, but what is our destination? I mean, I've, I've, I've entered the highway through Kottawa, but do I want to turn off at Walipana or I'm going all the way to Hikkadua or Gaul or even Matara? Where, where am I turn, turning off? I should know. So I'm coming into the fast lane, but where am I? What's my destination? Anyone else would give any other suggestion? Or give any other understanding? Or do you all agree with what the brothers have said? One said piety and the other said that we make a better self out of us. You'll have to interact in order for me to speak. Khair, inshallah, we'll go with that. Yes, both the answers are correct. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when He talks about our goal in Ramadan, our objective, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, kutiba alaykumu siyamu kama kutiba ala ladheena min qablikum, la'allakum tattakum. That we have made fasting obligatory upon you, like we did upon the nations before you. But your objective is, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ In order for you to bring taqwa. What is taqwa? To be Allah conscious. Be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all time. At all time we know that Allah is watching us. Allah is watching us. What is taqwa? When talking about taqwa, ulama explain to abide by the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to stay away from those things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden. That is taqwa. Or what is taqwa? As the brother said, to make ourselves a better Muslim, to make ourselves righteous Muslims. Taqwa? So, now we've got this Ramadan, we've got this fast lane in order to progress faster and attain that goal of becoming righteous Muslims. But a question that I would like to pose, which some of you all might not agree with, is that do we want to be righteous Muslims? Each and every one of us, let's ask ourselves that do I really want to be a pious person? Why, am you, why, why I am making you all ask it from yourselves is Sometimes there is a notion created amongst the youth that when you get pious, when you get pious, you lose out. You can no more enjoy life. There are so many things that you cannot do. Now you're pious, you can't do it. You've got a beard on your face, so you can't do it. So I ask you all again do we really want to be pious? Do we really want to be righteous Muslims? Definitely all the answers in all our hearts is yes. But the problem is why the, some of us are hesitant. Or some of us get this sometimes, not all the time, sometimes. That I should not get pious because if I get pious then I cannot enjoy life. That's because we haven't understood Islam. We haven't understood Islam. We've got just a very, very, uh, I would say, uh, incomplete picture of Islam. We haven't got the complete picture of Islam. The moment we get the complete picture, then we would say, no, I do want to become pious, because I know even after I get pious, I still can enjoy life. It's like, I would say, a kid, when we all were small, the first day to school, some of us cried, some of us did not cry. Yes, 
But most of us did not want to be there. When our parents said, now you have to go to school, most of us did not want to be there. Unless we had problems at home, where the mother or father was beating, uh, beating the child, the child does not want to be in school. Why? The child does not know what is in store for him there. The child's got the wrong image of school. Now I have to leave my mother and my father who are with me all the time. So I'm going to see new people. I don't know how they're going to treat me. But the moment that child enters the school, and if the school is going to give him the correct guidance, and if there's going to be the correct teachers there, there will come a time where the first day the child cried when going to school, the second day he cried, the third day he cried. But there will come a time where he will stop crying and he will go to school. And later on there will come a time where he will cry to go to school. He will tell his mother, no, I want to go to school. Mother will say, stay at home. No, he said, I want to go to school. Why? He has seen what is school. He has seen the reality of school. But I put a condition there. On condition that the school guides him well and the correct teachers are there. Similarly, Islam, when we look at it, it might look like a very difficult religion for us. It might look at, like a religion where when I enter Islam or when I get pious, when I become a true Muslim, then I'm restricted. There's too many laws that I have to follow. I can't do this, I can't do that. I'll have to only concentrate on this, etc., etc. But if we guided towards true Islam, then we'll see that it is not like that. Then we will enjoy Islam. So today, in, in the little time that we've got, inshallah, we'll discuss as to what is Islam. Today we're Muslims, but we fail to understand what is Islam. Nabi Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when talking to the Sahaba, when he was discussing, like this, there was a discussion amongst the Sahaba. So Nabi Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when describing Islam, says, بُنِيَ الْإِسْلَامُ عَلَىٰ خَمْسٍ Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam describes Islam with the example of a building. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says the foundation of Islam is laid upon five things. And these are what we call normally the pillars of Islam. The word bunya is mentioned in Arabic. And those who have learnt Arabic or those who are learning Arabic, if you have come across this word, you will understand bunya means to build something upon something. Bunya ala, to build something upon something. And bunya is majhul, the passive form, where it means a building is built on the foundation. So bunya islamu, the building of Islam. Allah Khamsin is built on five things. Those are the five pillars. Shahada, that there is none worthy of Allah of worship but Allah, and Nabi Akram sallallahu alayhi wa is the messenger of Allah. Iqam is salah, establishing salah. Ita is zakah, to give out salah as zakah. Hajj and fasting. These are the five pillars of Islam that we call. But Nabi Akram sallallahu alayhi wa is calling them the foundation of Islam. So if they are the foundation of Islam, what is Islam? Islam is based on these five things. There is a foundation under this building. Can anyone see the foundation? We have shahada in our hearts. Can anyone see the shahada? We read salah in our masajid. Do the non-Muslims see them? We give zakat to the Muslims. Do the non-Muslims see that? No. We fast for Allah. Besides us and Allah, no one knows about our fasting. Hajj is done in a place where non-Muslims are not permitted. So that's the foundation. Without them, without that foundation, Islam will not stand. But my question is, what is the Islam that is standing on that foundation? We see these pillars, we see the building. What is the building of Islam? is those aspects of life besides these five fundamental aspects. Yes, these are very important. Without them, Islam will not stand. Islam will fall. Even if one is missing, Islam will fall. But after we have achieved them, or whilst we are achieving them, we need to build the building of Islam. And 
that's all the other aspects of life. Whether it be cleanliness, whether it be morality, whether it be our marriages, whether it be our businesses, whether it be our interaction with others, our rights towards others, whether it be in the way we treat our neighbors, in the way we treat our women. Islam teaches us, Islam has guided us in each and every aspect of life. And this is the Islam that is visible. This is the Islam that those outside Islam would be attracted towards. I just had a suffer or a trip to Turkey. There one of them told me something which is very beautiful. He said, let us not call them non-Muslims. Let us call them not yet Muslims. We normally use the word non-Muslims. Let us not call them not non-Muslims. We have hope that they will accept Islam. So let us call them not yet Muslims. But they will only accept Islam if they can see Islam. We Muslims tend to think that this foundation is Islam. And we only building the foundation. The others outside Islam are waiting to see the building, but the building is not coming up. We are busy laying the foundation, but the building is not coming up. So today, I would like to emphasize on a few aspects of Islam. Few aspects of Islam wherein we have misunderstood. We haven't taught them to be as part of Islam. Hence, we haven't emphasized on that, we haven't acted upon that. And those outside Islam aren't able to see the true Islam. So, a few aspects amongst others. I mean, if you discuss all the aspects, it's each and every aspect of life. I mean, I would carry on for days and days and days and we would not finish. So, a few aspects where we have failed. We have failed to understand that it is part of Islam. Hence, we haven't portrayed it. And when we haven't portrayed it, those outside haven't seen it. And one of those aspects is cleanliness. I mean, the amount Islam has emphasized upon cleanliness, no other religion has emphasized. So much so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes to the extent of saying, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ التَّوَّابِينَ وَيُحِبُّ الْمُتَطَهِّرِينَ Allah loves those who repent and Allah loves those who are clean. Allah loves those who are pure and clean. Allah loves them. And Nabi Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when mentioning the innate character of human beings, that is the nat- what, what is supposed to be natural in human beings, Nabi Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam talks about the aspects of cleanliness. And cleanliness is also a prerequisite, it's a condition for being in a state that is most beloved to Allah. That is, when we're going to pray, the place, state that is most beloved to Allah is sajda in prayer. Because that's when we are closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But to be in the state of sajda, what do we need? Wudu. So cleanliness is a condition to be in the state that is most beloved to Allah. So Islam emphasizes so much upon cleanliness. And as a Muslim, we are clean inside and outside. That is, it's not only outside that we are showing that we are clean and neat. We are, we are putting a few sprays on us and showing everyone that no, we are very clean and we are pure people. But from inside we don't even wash when we go to the toilet. No, we Muslims are not like that. Once a, a student who was in UK, he related to me that when they were in UK, they had no means of washing their own clothes. So they used to give to the, a woman used to come and collect their clothes and uh, she used to wash them for them. So they used to live with a few, I mean, not yet Muslims, I would say, or people of the country. So she used these Muslims that do you all wash your inner wear before you give it to us? So they said, no. And they asked, why are you asking us this question? She said, no, when the, the others, they give their inner wear, there's so much impurity upon it, we have to actually wash them before putting them into the washing machine or whatever. But when you all give your clothes, we don't find it on them. 
So this shows the purity of Islam. So with all these teachings, with all this emphasis upon cleanliness, we might think that we are the trendsetters in hygiene and in cleanliness. But sadly we aren't. And a good example of this is, let us go to a place which is densely populated by Muslims. Is it known for its cleanliness? Let us not go so far. far. Let us look into the toilets of our masajid. Are we portraying cleanliness? And on the other hand, those very people who aren't clean inside and only show cleanliness outside, they become the flag bearers of cleanliness. Wherein in our language, or the language of Tamil, when someone is very clean, we start saying, Aum vella karanapola. If those who understand Tamil will understand. We say he's like a white man. He's very clean. I mean, we are much cleaner than that white man. Islam emphasizes and teaches us more cleanliness than that white man. But then why is it that we are not known for our cleanliness? It's because we have never regarded it as part of Islam. And we haven't portrayed it as part of Islam. Secondly, let's, let's move to another topic. Topic which is, uh, I would say, uh, very largely discussed, that is women's rights. Now when it comes to women's rights, we look at the teachings of Nabi Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, very clearly said, خَيْرُكُمْ خَيْرُكُمْ لِأَهْلِهِ وَأَنَا خَيْرُكُمْ لِأَهْلِهِ That the best from amongst you are those who are best towards their women. And I am the best towards my, towards my women. These are the words of Nabi Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Guiding us and teaching us that we should be good towards our women. And when we look at the lifestyle of Nabi Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Not a single one of the Azwaj al Mutahharat, the wives of Nabi Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, our mothers, none of them have ever complained that Nabi Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was harsh to them. Nabi Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was unjust to them. Nabi Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not treat them properly. So Nabi Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has shown us the best of examples in regards to women and in regards to how to treat women. And we living in a society where a woman's worth is proportionate to her beauty. That means she is only as worth as, as, as a beauty. The moment she starts losing her beauty, she is worthless. The moment she starts growing older and losing her beauty, she is worthless. That's the society that we are living in. That's why one of the fastest selling products are anti-aging creams. Why people are scared to get old? Because they know if they get old, they lose their value. Whereas Islam, what does it teach us? Islam shows us that the older a woman grows, more her, more her value increases, her worth increases. So much so that when she becomes a mother, one of the greatest accolades ever given to a human being is what Islam gave to a mother, wherein Islam said, that Jannah, paradise lies under the feet of the mother. So a religion that emphasizes so much upon women's rights, upon giving women that daraja, that status, and giving women, uh, I mean treating women in the correct way, we should have been recognized for women's rights. But on the other hand, we call women bashers all around the world. Why? Because we haven't understood this. We haven't first learnt it and we haven't understood it to be part of Islam and we haven't portrayed it to the others so that they accept this as a, a, a characteristic of Islam. Let's move on to another topic. I'm just picking on a few topics which, which we would understand. The topic of modesty, of bashfulness. And these are topics that the youth need more than the rest. That a youth need to create that modesty in them, that bashfulness in them. 
So when it comes to modesty, very clear a hadith. إِنَّ لِكُلِّ دِينٍ خُلُقًا وَخُلُقُ الْإِسْلَامِ الْحَيَاءُ That every religion has got a characteristic. Every religion has got a characteristic. And the characteristic of Islam is what? Haya, modesty. Whether you call it modesty or bashfulness or inhibition, whatever name you give it, but you cannot do justice to the word haya. Islam's got haya. Haya is the characteristic of Islam. So much so that Nabi Akram sallallahu alayhi wa goes on to say, Al-Haya'u shu'batum min al-Iman. That haya is one of the branches of Iman. Without haya, Iman is incomplete. So a question now arises again. Are we the flag bearers? We Muslims, are we the flag bearers of modesty? Some might argue and say, yes, why not? In our women we see parda. They show bashfulness, they show, they show modesty. Yes, a fair enough argument. But I would ask you today, as students, we have stayed with many kinds of students. Students where majority are Muslims. Do we show modesty in us? When there is a group of the opposite sex walking, have we got the modesty to lower our gazes? Have we got that bashfulness that we do not speak anything vulgar or anything immoral in front of our elders or even amongst us? And have, I would go a step further. Are we modest enough not to be involved in pornography. My recent trip to Turkey, one of those from Turkey was explaining, Allahu A'lam how true it is. But he was explaining, and this should be the, the, the characteristic of every Muslim, that in Turkey they are not allowed to go onto pornographic sites. It's, it's banned, it's blocked. And people would normally not do so because of the modesty found in them. And he said, okay, there is no parda in Turkey. If you go to Turkey, it would look like a European country to you. But in spite of that, he would say the, the, the most that a girl and a boy would go to, or the, the extreme that they would go to, is they would talk to each other, or they would date each other. That's the extreme that they would go to, and they wouldn't go beyond that. Islam prohibits that also, but what I'm trying to say is, the level of modesty there and the level of modesty here and the level of modesty that we tried, we have to try to attain. Today we are losing that modesty. As Muslims we are losing it. We are losing that morality that we are supposed to have, that, that is supposed to be a characteristic of a Muslim. And we see one of the highest rates when it comes to usage of pornography, Sri Lanka stands very high and Muslims are no exception. Why? We have lost the mother, morality, lost morality. And many Muslim countries around the world are from amongst the top of the list. Why is it? Why? Because we haven't brought this modesty into us. The modesty that Islam teaches, we haven't regarded it as part of Islam. And we haven't portrayed it to the community outside, to those outside Islam. And similarly, I, I can go on talking when it comes to trustworthiness, when it comes to not lying, when it comes to keeping our promises. Those who are in the bazaar, you, you people haven't stepped into the bazaar yet. But when you step into the bazaar, the biggest complaint is people come to us and say, your people are like that. That's the word they use. Your people cannot be trusted. See your person, he said two months, six months gone, his, his, the bill hasn't been paid as yet. He said he'll pay in two months, he hasn't paid in six months. So this is a general trend carrying on in Muslims, that Muslims have failed to understand Islam. The true Islam that they needed to understand, Muslims have failed to understand. Hence, a bad name is created about Islam. Even when it comes to our interpersonal relationships, or how we, or human rights, I would not like to use the word human rights, because it's the most misused term. If you all understand what I'm saying, around the world, 
one of the most misused terms is human rights. But when it comes to human rights, Islam teaches us so beautifully that when talking about the qualities of muttaqeen, qualities of those who have taqwa, the Quran says, وَالْكَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْضُ وَالْعَافِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ Those who are forgiving towards other people. Those are true Muslims. And when we look at the traits of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, that they were in the highest level of, uh, I would say, uh, fulfilling human rights. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about them, وَيُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصًا that they used to give preference over themselves even when they were at a disadvantage. They were at a disadvantage, but they would give preference to others over themselves. These were the Sahaba. Islam says if you can't reach the status of the Sahaba, then come one step down. That a person cannot be called a true mu'min unless he loves for himself, loves for his brother what he loves for himself. He cannot be called a true mu'min. I want this for me, I want this for my brother too. I want to become wealthy, I should, I should want my brother to become wealthy too. Not that I have good business and my brother does not have good business. Not that I am earning well, my brother is not earning. And not that I have the comforts, my brother does not have the comforts and I don't care. Islam does not teach us that. Islam says, want for your brother what, would you, what you would want for yourself. And even if you, if you can't do, go to that level, then the least that you could do is Al-Muslimu man salim al-Muslimuna min lisanihi wa yadih. That a true Muslim is the one who does not inconvenience another Muslim, whether through his tongue or through his hand. That's a true Muslim. Today are we portraying this Islam? When it comes to parking outside our masjid, do we make sure that we don't inconvenience others? It's the opposite. Some of the masajid were about to be closed. Sorry. Some of the masajid were about to be closed. Why? Because the neighbors had complained that people park in front of our gates. We are inconvenienced by Muslims. So is this the Islam that we portray? And because of this, those outside have gone to the level of calling us terrorists. And today that is the picture put into the hearts of those outside Islam and also into the hearts of Muslimin. That's why I said there is a notion created amongst our youths that they do not want to be pious. Because they think that when I get pious, then I'll be called a terrorist. This is what the outside media has done to us. This is what they have done to our hearts. This is how they have played, to us, played on our hearts. They portrayed the wrong Islam. And who is to blame for that? Muslims ourselves. Why? Because we haven't learned the correct Islam. And we haven't portrayed the correct Islam. So my dear respected elders and brothers, I'm not sharing these with you to make you all despondent and say, no, okay, now we doomed, we are gone. No. I am sharing these with you to show us what Islam has, to, has in store for us. We are Muslims. We should portray the best of character. We should be the best of people. We have it in us. We should understand that, the, that Allah who created us, His guidance is the best guidance in every aspect of life. We can be the best in every aspect of life if we wanted to, only on condition that we, we, we looked into true Islam, we studied true Islam and we portrayed it. And we saw that in our predecessors, when they had true Islam in them, they ruled one third of the world. Go to countries like Turkey, go to countries where Islam ruled, and you will see how they ruled. Subhanallah. We visited one of their palaces, and even today a person who visits that palace admires the architecture, admires how the palace has been built. Imagine a person who, those outside Islam, who visited them 500 years ago. What fear and what awe would have been created in their hearts looking at those structures? Subhanallah, the, 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 the extent they went to, I mean, in the masajid, 
Yahya, I think you have to go. So in the masajid, they have put up chandeliers. And the chandeliers are hung on, I would say, stilts or structures like that. Wherein, if we had it in our country, it would be filled with cobwebs. But you go visit Turkey and visit those mosques, not a single one of them have cobwebs. And do you know why? They had 500 years, or even more, more than 500 years ago, they had come with a mechanism to repel cobwebs, where cobwebs wouldn't come. That is, they hung ostrich eggs on those chandeliers. If you look at those chandeliers very, uh, I mean, uh, carefully, you would notice a few ostrich eggs from, uh, I mean, uh, with uh, a, dist- a, a, a small distance apart, they would ha- hang ostrich eggs, but very beautifully hung. That would repel cobwebs. That would allow spiders to put on cobwebs in there. So, subhanallah, this is how advanced we Muslims were at one time. So what has happened to us that we've lost it? This is what Islam had taught us. Islam had brought us Muslims to that level. But today we left Islam and today the world is looking down upon us. Where the world feared us. Where there was a time when the world feared us and the world envied us. Today the world is controlling us. They're trampling us. And they're looking down upon us. Why? It's because we left this Islam. And we left that Islam so much that we today we fail to recognize it as Islam. In Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about nasiyam mansiyya. One is to forget and one is to forget that we have forgotten. Today we haven't only forgotten Islam but we have forgotten that we have forgotten Islam. And we just concentrate on the, on the foundation of Islam and we think that we are Muslims. No. Muslims are those. Muslims were the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. Muslims were our pious predecessors who, who portrayed Islam to the rest of the world. Who ruled by the book of Islam on one third of the world and people looked up to them. People did not call them oppressors. They wanted them to rule. They would prefer that Muslims rule them than anyone else. So my dear respected elders, and I would say my dear students, how can we come up to that level? How can we regain our pride? How can we regain our status? I would say the best opportunity is in your hands. Because you are youth. And youth is fertile ground. Today the West has understood that. Whatever you cultivate in them, you can get out of them. Youth is fertile ground. So the West is trying their best. Our, uh, the enemies of Islam, they are trying their best to cultivate that which is evil. To cultivate that which is wrong. To give the wrong, pre- wrong picture of Islam and to divert our youth towards the wrong things. Whether it be through media, through their movies. I'll just ask you one example. Who's the hero of a movie normally? Think about it. Normally, uh, the hero of a movie is the one is is the one who has an illicit relationship with the opposite sex. Is it true or not? So they may not say it in words, but they're saying it through their movies. They're saying it through their media. They're showing it through their media that this is to be cool. To be cool is to have a girlfriend. To be cool is to have an illicit relationship. Because when you do that, you're a hero. And those parents of y'all who want good for y'all and they're stopping them, they're the villains in that movie. So you see the picture that is being created? So our enemies are working on us, especially amongst our youths. Why? Because they understand that the, if they spoil the youth, they spoil the generations to come. Because our youths 
are the ones who take the baton to the next generation. They spoil the youth, they spoil the generations to come. So it is time for us to stand up. You all are in the best of all ages, the youths. When you all can achieve anything you all want with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we've got the best of times that's coming to us. That is the fast lane that we're talking about. The month of Ramadan. So let us use our youth in this fast lane, in this month of Ramadan to make a difference. One person made a difference. One person, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, made effort, he made a difference in the whole world. Today Islam is found in, found all over the world. Why? Through the effort of one man. So let's not think that, no, I'm only one person, what am I going to do? No, one person can make a difference. So let us rise up today. Let us get up and say, no, this Ramadan, I want to make a difference. Because Ramadan is a time where everything is multiplied, it's the fast lane, and it's also a time where other things are suppressed. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, غُلِّقَتْ أَبْوَابُ الْجَنَّةِ فُتِّحَتْ أَبْوَابُ الْجَنَّةِ وَغُلِّقَتْ أَبْوَابُ النَّارِ وَصُدِّفَتِ الشَّيَاطِينَ That the doors of Jannah are open, the doors of good are open. غُلِّقَتْ أَبْوَابُ النَّارِ The doors of Jahannam, those of hell are closed, those of bad are closed. And shayateen are tied up. So this is a month that we want to instill something good in us, we can. But how do we do it? Yes, this is the month of Qur'an. We should engage a lot in Tilawatul Qur'an, but at the same time, let us try to understand Qur'an. How do we understand Qur'an? Let us go to ulama. MashaAllah, you all have been coming here from month to month. So you all must be acquainted with quite a few ulama who speak your language. So let's go to these ulama. Request them that I want to know the traits of mu'mineen, the traits of Muslims that has been mentioned in the Qur'an. I'll just give you a few examples. If you take Surah Furqan of the Holy Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the last ayat of Surah Furqan, Allah, the last ruku of Surah Furqan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the traits of Muslim mu'mineen there. وَعِبَادُ الرَّحْمَانِ الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنَا And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about traits of mu'mineen. Similarly, when we look at Surah Nisa, Yes, Surah Ali Imran, sorry. Surah Ali Imran, verse number 133 to 136 of Ali Imran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّن رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the traits of mu'mineen there. Traits of muttaqeen. So the, in Surah Furqan, the last ruku, the last ayn of Surah Furqan, starting from ayah number 63 right till the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about ibadur rahman, the servants of Allah. And in Surah Ala Imran, verse 133 to 136, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about muttaqeen. And if you take Surah Mu'minun, Surah Mu'minun, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right in the beginning of Surah Mu'minun talks about the traits of mu'mineen. So let us go to ulama, let us tell them, we heard about this. Why don't you explain this to us? Why we want to bring in the characteristic, the traits of mu'mineen, the traits of muttaqeen, the traits of the servants of Allah. Explain this to us, we want to bring them into our lives. Let us ask the ulama to explain the stories of the prophets of the past. Because the stories of the Prophets of the past have been explained in the Qur'an as a means of lesson for us. And yes, when Nabi Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam faced problems and adversities in his life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down stories of the Prophet. When we face adversities and when we face problems in our life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the seerah of our beloved Nabi Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Let us make an effort to learn that seerah. How many of us know the lifestyle of Nabi Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Not only seerah in the sense of the events that happened in the time of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but seerah in the sense that what were the characteristics of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? There's a book written on the characteristics of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called Shama'il Tirmidhi. Shama'il of Imam Tirmidhi, wherein Imam Tirmidhi talks about each and every aspect. It has been even translated into English. If not, we request an alim to read it from Arabic and 
to explain it to us in English. Wherein even the I mean appearance of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam is discussed. The the way Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam walked, the way Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam ate, the way Nabi Akram sallallahu alayhi wasallam slept, each and every aspect is discussed. Today we've got time for everything else, but we haven't got time for these things. And let us read into the lifestyle of Sahaba radiallahu anhum. I would say they are our unsung heroes. They are the ones who brought Islam to us. More than 100,000 Sahaba present in Hajjatul Wada. But only around 10,000 buried in Hijaz in the Arabian Peninsula. Where are the rest of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum? They traveled all over the world so that they spread Islam all over the world. They lived Islam. They portrayed Islam. So let us read their lifestyle. There are so many books written, even in English. Hayatul Sahaba is translated in English. If we can read that. Or if that is too high, let us... I mean, there are other books like Men and Women Around the Prophet. Or Men and Women Around Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Let us read books like that. I mean, written in English, where the lifestyle of Sahaba radiallahu anhu is explained. Today, when we take our youth, you're asking about a cricketer, he will tell you from the age of the cricketer to how many 50s he scored and how many centuries he's made, and how many years he's played cricket, and what's his fastest century and what's his fastest 50, and they'll give you every detail. Today, can any one of us give such detail about our Sahaba? They are our heroes, but we don't know about them. Mind you, Allah, uh, Nabi Akram sallallahu alayhi wa says, Al-mar'u ma'aman ahabba. A person will be resurrected with those whom he likes. Today, if you're following sports stars and movie stars, then Allah save us, will be resurrected on the day of Qiyamah with them. Do we want to face, say, face the same fate as them? Or do we want to face the fate of Sahaba radiallahu anhu? Definitely we would want to be amongst the Sahaba. Then let us read about them. Let us bring their characteristics. Let us bring their traits into our lives. So let us make this Ramadan a means of change. Let us read about, let us, as I said, look into the Quran. Read Seerah of Nabi Akram sallallahu alayhi wa Read about our unsung heroes. And let us start practicing from now. When it comes to Ramadan, Nabi Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his khutbah advised us that we should make it a habit that we help someone break a fast. One who helps someone break, break, breaks, break a fast, his sins are forgiven and he is saved from the torment of the fire. And he gets the same reward as the one who breaks the fast. So let us do those things. Nabi Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that one who stays up in Ramadan, stays in Salah, stands in Salah in Ramadan, Imanam wa ihtisaban, ghufira lahu ma taqaddama min dhambihi wa ma ta'akhar, that his sins will be forgiven, his, what do you call, whatever sins he had done before, they will be forgiven. So yes, let us indulge ourselves in ibadah, indulge ourselves in the, in the tilawat of the Holy Quran, but at the same time, let us make this Ramadan, a time, a means where we create these, char- uh, these characteristics in us. Where we bring true Islam into us. We bring that Islam that was found in the Sahaba. We bring that Islam that was found in Nabi Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And let us start it from now. Let us prepare for Ramadan from now. Let us not leave it for the last day. Because what happens is, we've got a lot of enthusiasm. This Ramadan I want to do, this I want to do, that I want to do that. But what happens? We start, wait for the first of Ramadan to start reading Quran. We wait for the first of Ramadan to start fasting. We wait for the first of Ramadan to start reading Tarawiya. In the beginning we got a lot of josh. It's like that uh, two liter Pepsi bottle. In the beginning there's a lot of gas. But as we start pouring and pouring and pouring, at the bottom we say there's nothing left. So as days carry on, beginning we say masjid's full. I mean, the the trustees want to build up another floor on the masjid. That's how full it is. But as days go on, we can count the number of stuffs that are left. So let us not make our Ramadan like that. Let us warm up before Ramadan. Let us not become like that player who is already retired in five overs because he didn't warm up before the match. 
So let us warm up before Ramadan. Get ready for Ramadan from now. So what I told, what I advised y'all, let us start doing from now. I mean, you cannot get onto the fast lane from zero speed. You have to come from zero to hundred. And zero to hundred you have to do it in the lanes that are before the fast lane. So let us get to 100, 120 before we get onto the fast lane. So let us start fasting from now. Maybe Mondays and Thursdays we start fasting. From, because this was the sunnah of Nabi Akram sallallahu alayhi wa If you can't do twice a week, at least once a week let us start fasting. And with that, ayyam ul 13, 14, 15th of every, night, every month, Nabi Akram sallallahu alayhi wa fasted. So with the knee of that sunnah, let us fast the 13th, 14th and 15th of this month. So that before Ramadan we prepare. Now when the fasting of Ramadan comes, it's not difficult because we practice. Let us start reading the Hajjud from now. Why when Ramadan comes we start reading Tarawih, we know we, we, our legs are used to standing in Salah, used to standing in Tahajjud. Let us start reading Quran from now. So when it comes to Ramadan and we're reading Quran, our, our minds are used to, our mouths are used to. And let us start reading what I told you. Let us start learning. The, the characteristics of Mu'mineen and Muttaqeen and the servants of Allah from the Qur'an. Let us start reading the seerah. Let us start reading about our pious predecessors, the Sahaba radiallahu anhu. Let us start reading about them from now. So when it comes to Ramadan, we know what we are reading and it will be easy for us to instill them into our lives. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give each and every one of us the topic to make amal to bring these characteristics in our life, to show true Islam, to become the flag bearers of true Islam, and to become those that people envy, not those that envy. I asked you all to be interactive, but you all didn't seem to be. But now, inshallah, if you all have any doubts in your mind, which are asked with a good niya, well, not with the niya of creating any uh, controversy or anything, asked with a good niya, inshallah, you can put them forward, inshallah. If it's within my means, I will answer. If it's not, then I'll give you all my number, and, or I'll take your number and, inshallah, let you know in the future. So if there's anything that you all need to discuss, you can ask me. You see, the question he's asking is, sometimes we, may, we tend to concentrate on certain aspects of Islam, and the aspects that I mentioned today, we do not tend to concentrate on that. Or... Uh, Yes, in order to do that, firstly, to, uh, when you talk about softening of hearts, dhikr is the best medicine to soft our, soften our hearts. And dhikr means remembrance of Allah. We remember Allah. Remembering of Allah could be done by maybe sitting, sitting in uh, solitude and doing the dhikr. That is, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar. That is one way of remembering Allah. The other is through the Quran itself. Quran itself is one of the best modes of so we sit with Quran and we concentrate. And if you cannot understand, we, we, we just make dua to Allah that Allah give us understanding of Quran. And dhikr, remembrance of Allah can also be done through tafakkur. That is uh, pondering about Allah. We ponder about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We look at the creations of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Ali Imran, Inna fi khalqi samawati wal ardi wa akhtilafi layli wa nahar, talks about pondering over the creations of Allah. That we look at each and every creation, how beautifully Allah has created. Look at creation of man, how beautifully Allah has created man. Each and everything about man is so perfect. There's, I mean, there's nothing that we can say, okay, you know, if this I was here or the, if this was a little bit different or like this or like that, it would have been better. There's nothing like that about man that we can see. So likewise, each and every creation of Allah, let us ponder over Allah. This is how we soften our hearts. That's one. And second thing, if you notice what I spoke on, it's to do mostly about our interaction with others. If you look into the Quran, there are amongst animals mentioned in the Quran, three animals specifically mentioned. Specifically. That means that particular animal or bird is mentioned. One is in the story of the people of the cave. The dog is mentioned. وَكَلْبُهُمْ بَاسِطٌ بِرَاعِهِ بِالْوَسِيلِ 
The other is the story of, uh, both come in the story of Sulaiman alayhi salam. One is the ant. Ant was trying to save the rest of the ants from getting trampled. And the, the third uh, creature that is mentioned is the hudhud. The bird. That came to Sulaiman alayhi salam, brought news from another place to Sulaiman alayhi salam and was worried that these other people are not following Islam. In all three, if you look at, look at all three incidents, they were worried about their kind. The dog, not about their kind, about others. The dog was worried about those people of the cave, so was guarding the cave. The ant was worried about the rest of the ants, so was actually asking them to go inside. And this hudhud, the bird, was worried about another nation that they are not following Islam. So what Allah loves most is that worry. And if you take Surah Yasin, there's mention of one particular person in Surah Yasin. Why? Because he worried about his nation. Three prophets came and propagated Islam, none of them accepted. He worried about his nation, he asked him, why aren't you all accepting these prophets? They are telling you what is good. The nation killed him. And Allah says that even after going into Jannah, He'll say, Ya layta qawmi ya'lamoon That only if my nation knew the way Allah has treated me, they would have also accepted Islam. So it's that worry. So in Islam, Islam is not a selfish religion. Where we worry only about ourselves and say, you know, I have lived my maximum. I, I, I'll only worry about myself, my ibadat, my salah, my zakat, my soul, my hajj finish. And my shahada, that's it. No. Islam says, worry about others. Bring the characteristics of Islam in you, so that you portray true Islam. When you portray true Islam, others will accept Islam. So whatever action I do, let me ask myself, am I benefiting another through this? Am I portraying the true Islam, a true, true picture of Islam through this? Or am I being a means of the other not accepting Islam? If we start doing that, then we'll see that all these aspects that I mentioned will come into our lives. Cleanliness will come because when I'm unclean and inconveniencing the other. Mod mo modesty will come because when, when I don't have mod modesty in him, I'm repelling others from me. So they won't accept Islam. They'll be repelled from the Muslim kind. Likewise, each and every aspect that I told you, it's more about living for others than living for ourselves. Today, the world is trying to convey the message, every man for himself and God for all. But in Islam, we don't say that. We say, yes, God is for all, but every man is living for the other man. If we bring that in us, we live for the others, then Allah, Allah subhanahu wa Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, man lam yashkurin nas, lam yashkurillah. One that cannot be grateful to people, cannot be grateful to Allah. So when you start living for others, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take care of our lives. Is anything else, anyone else needs to discuss? Or any other suggestions that you all might give? That alhamdulillah they are having this program on a monthly basis. Any suggestions from your side that you all need? I mean, in future, these are the kinds of topics we need or we uh, should be concentrated on. Or future, if it's delivered in this way, it would be better or anything like that. It's an open discussion. I mean, here there's no sheikh and no students. We all, I may not be as young as you all, but alhamdulillah, I'm still young. Only a few white here, that's all. سبحان الله وبحمده سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت استغفرك وأتوب إليك. This what was spoken إن شاء الله we'll ponder over it and please include me also in your du'as when you'll get up for tahajjud or make ibadat in Ramadan. Include me and the Muslims. I wouldn't say the Muslims. Humanity at large. Let us include all of them in our du'as. That Allah. Those who haven't got hidayah, give them hidayah. Those who are upon Islam, show them true Islam. And make them true Muslims. And make us true Muslims.